what, 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 you say my agent is on the other line? Oh, tell him I'll call him right back. I've got a show to do. And action. Welcome everyone. I'm Billy and this is Show and Tell. I am recording in my apartment in Manhattan. And if this is your first time with me, you probably want to go back and see my very first episode where I describe my apartment. If you're coming back and you've seen previous episodes, then let me say welcome back. There are quite a few of you uh, new subscribers, so thank you for hitting that little button down below. This corner, I think it is. Everything is in reverse, but I think it's that corner where it says subscribe. So if you have not yet subscribed, you probably want to go ahead and do that. And there's a little bell there, which if you ding that, you'll get notifications each time I'm out with a new episode. You can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Billy Toy, and I'll put that on the screen so you'll have the correct spelling. Now, in a prior episode, I showed you this object. It's called a French knitter. Sometimes it's known as a Nancy knitting, knitting Nancy, something like that. I don't know. I know it as a French knitter, which I've had since I'm a little girl. The reason I'm showing it again is there was something in the news recently, which you're going to see in a moment, totally reminded me of this. So keep this in mind. And I'm going to go to a, an image of something that was in the news. Hang on. I know a lot of my viewers are math or science oriented, but it's not every day that knitting and science actually merge and are covered by the news. So I didn't want to miss sharing this article from the journal Materials, Science and Engineering. You can imagine my astonishment when I came across this photograph because it looks so much like what I showed you in that French knitter. The caption of the image that you're seeing is a circular knitting machine creates an artery graft out of a hybrid yarn. And the photograph was taken by someone named Fan Zhang, who's the lead author of this scientific article. I'm going to read you some excerpts from the article. Heart attack patients often need replacements for damaged or blocked sections of coronary arteries, which are usually taken from their own leg veins. But in a new study, scientists knitted a prototype graft out of hybrid synthetic and biological yarn, forming a scaffold for the patient's own cells to grow around and repair the artery. Let me show you the photo of that yarn. Bear with me a second. The caption on this image explains that this is a microscope image of the hybrid yarn composed of collagen and synthetic polylactic acid fibers. Now going back to the article, the method of replacing damaged coronary arteries with one from elsewhere in a patient's body is currently the best option. But not only is it invasive, some patients don't have viable vessels available that's what encouraged the researchers from North Carolina State University and Case Western Reserve to investigate alternatives. The team combined two types of fibers into one hybrid yarn and used a circular knitting machine to fashion it into an artery replacement. One fiber was collagen, while the other was a synthetic fiber made of polyactic acid, polylactic acid rather, and that's what you're seeing here. Together, the new material was able to expand and contract just like the real thing. Let me go back to the other image, if I may. Uh, 
but it's not made to be permanent. It's not made to be a permanent implant. Instead, it's a scaffold to help the patient's own cells build a new artery. Those endothelial cells, which normally line the insides of arteries, stick to the scaffold and begin growing. The fibers would eventually degrade and be absorbed into the body. That includes the synthetic fibers, which become lactic acid, a common chemical in the body that's well tolerated in low amounts. So I thought it would be interesting to show you how science and knitting can intersect. Who knew? So this is my current finished object. It's called Bird Song, and the designer, I know I'm going to wreck this name, is Maschen Wunder Manja Vogelsang. And it's knit on size two needles, painstakingly, especially this two by two rib where it's knit to purl to. Not fun with a tiny needle like that. Um, the yarn I used is, once again, Sisu by Sandness Garn. And the color is called Red. 4218. And in here, uh, it's Knit Picks palette in navy 6416. I did a little eye cord around the neck. And um, I, I did change the pattern ever so slightly. Let me see if I can give you a good close up view of the birds. It's really beautifully written pattern. She has different charts for the different sizes because if you're a larger size, you'll have more repeats of this. So it was really fun to see it taking shape. There are a couple of people on YouTube whose videos I really admire a great deal and who have a remarkable presence on Ravelry as well, and who were so very helpful. Probably the one that comes to mind first is someone who recently mentioned me in her podcast, Roxanne Richardson. She's a master knitter. She's an unbelievable knitter. She's unbelievably generous with her knowledge and I just wanted to give a shout out to her. I so appreciated her mentioning me up front in one of her recent podcasts. This is the first time I'm recording since she podcast. Otherwise, I would have been mentioning her sooner. So thank you, Roxanne. Hats off to you. So in just a moment, I'm going to be breaking away to welcome my guest to the screen. And I will be right back with Jessica. Well, okay, it is stage time. <laughs> Even yes. though all the Broadway theaters are closed, it's only a couple of miles from where I live. And they're talking about not reopening until probably late next year. Yes. Mid to late next year. Anyway. People, I want to introduce you to my fantastic guest who's coming to you from Sweden today. Jessica, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and please tell us something about your city that we wouldn't necessarily know if we came there as tourists. Okay. Hi, my name is Jessica and I live here in Stockholm, Sweden, but I'm originally from Gotland and Considering how many things from the Viking Age era that has been exhumed in gold and silver, I would suggest that you shouldn't miss out the historical museum in Stockholm because there are plenty of treasures from Viking Age era and beyond. And when it comes to textiles, you have medieval embroideries and also uh, the Royal Castle has also a museum, which is the Royal Wardrobe. And that too is something extra. So those two are my 
little tips for you. Well, I just wanted to say, even though we're recording this at the moment when something special is happening in Stockholm, it won't be seen by viewers until after all the Nobel Prizes have been awarded. But yeah. how, does, how does that feel to a local person when it's happening? Is there a lot of buzz in the air when each day, day after day, they're announcing who the winners are? Uh, we have a journalist, um, and I'm sorry, I, I forgot his name at the moment, uh, Stieg something. And every year when the Nobel Prize in Literature was announced by the Swedish Academy, he used to stand there in the press and always shout out, Entligen, which translates into finally, considering that, oh yes, finally this literature talent will have the honor to receive the prize and it's sort of a Swedish joke more or less it's like okay when does he shout it oh yeah now he shouts it I've been in the hall where they have the big celebration mm -hmm. it's a very very beautiful beautiful place and I've also been to Gotland I was very fortunate I guess it's about 26 or 27 years ago to be on a cruise around the Baltic Sea with my family and Visby was one of our ports of call, as was Stockholm and mm. Tallinn, Estonia, and St. Petersburg, and some other, oh, Gdansk, Poland, some really great ports of call. So it's a very interesting part of the world, the whole Hanseatic League and some of the ruins that are there. So for my viewers, if you have an opportunity to go and see the Gotland sheep, I, I will insert a picture here. I saw that there's a coat of arms of Gotland that has a sheep as part of its... Uh, yes. it was actually a uh, sigil for the Gotlandic traders and then during the Hanseatic League it turned out translated into the sigil for the merchant the Gotlandic merchant living in Visby and then later on when you got into um, and now I can't remember the word uh, cities and, and um, so on and shires that sigil was turned into our Shire symbol. So mm. it's quite interesting. It has an old, old history. Yes, very sweet. Okay, I know that you have some vintage sweaters that you're going to share with us. And along the way, don't forget to tell us about the patterns because it sounds like you have quite a collection of vintage patterns. I think my viewers will be interested to know how you came to acquire these patterns. Not all of them are clearly written in Swedish. Probably some of them are in English. Oh, and you know what? I, I don't want to forget to mention, this is a good point to mention it. I don't know if my people know that down at the bottom where it says CC for closed caption, you can get subtitles to this and the little gear next to it if you click on that it'll bring up a place where you can select the language so if english is not your language but you want to hear this translated into swedish not hear it but read it in swedish or any <laughs> other language french german italian and so on there is a way to do that so i'm sorry to interrupt you go ahead no problem. Yes, uh, the majority of the uh, patterns I've been knitting are actually in English because it's much easier to find uh, on the internet. Um, and I found a treasure trove, a real treasure trove uh, and in the National Library of Australia, digitalized newspapers and magazines. Oh, it's yes. Trove. For sure. mm -hmm. Yes. And the majority of those patterns I've been knitting are from Trove. Um, and I'm also a member of on Ravelry, um, and my name there is Kite Love. Which it's, I will put uh, on the screen. 
Yes, it's the Gotlandic, well, the Gutnik world for lefty. So I'm a lefty. Oh, are you? Are <laughs> yes, you? I am. So does that mean that you knit continental? With uh, the, I, the yeah, no, I, I, I live, I live, uh, I need right handed, but uh, in the continental way, which is with John on the left finger. Right. Um, but I do it in the more Scandinavian or Norwegian style. So it's, it's sort of a version, uh, well, a dialect perhaps you could say, of the continental way of knitting. Mm. It's, it's a bit like uh, Portuguese has their uh, local way of knitting certain stitches and Italians too. And uh, in the Eastern part of Europe, you knit through the back loop mostly, continuously. It's a bit, if you, if you uh, check up on Russian knitting, it's the same manner in which to do it. So I knit in more or less the Norwegian way, but I was taught by my mom and she's from Gotland too. So it, it's a mixture of continental and Norwegian. Okay. And uh, well, hmm, should I start with one of the oldest first or more recent? It's up to you, up to you. Let's see here. Have. Yes, I can start with, this is actually uh, a mix between two patterns. Um, let's see if I can, without too much, uh, perhaps I should do like this. This is from the German Sachenmayen. Oh, I think it's pronounced like that. And this from the 1930s. Uh, it was German knitting and crochet monthly pattern books. Can you and hold it right up to your camera? A little higher, a little higher up. Great, good. Okay, then I know the level to hold it. Uh, I actually knit it for my boyfriend, well, domestic partner, um, because he wanted something warm. And this is the shawl color sweater he got. But the stitch pattern is actually from uh, an Australian pattern. And it's a sort of chevron pattern or zigzag. No, it's, it's a zigzag pattern of pearl stitches. I've seen you wearing something that has a similar design. I think I've seen on Instagram or Ravelry I love, I love that chevron. Yes, it's, it's so easy to, to knit. I think it's, that one was about uh, 10 rows total. So you do the, the knitting, well, pearl on the uneven row, back rows, and then you do the stitch pattern on the even rows. So every other stitch, uh, one row. You're, you're getting closer and closer. Yes. So you get the zigzag pattern that way. So it's it's actually a beginning beginner pattern. It's not an, a difficult pattern to stitch uh, or knit. Um, and a lot of stitch patterns from the 1930s and 40s in in a lot of patterns actually are quite easy stitch patterns. It's the shape and the cuts and and the different pieces. The construction. Actually, yeah, and the construction that makes it a bit more challenging in some patterns, especially when it comes to distractions. Yes, the things that are missing, you have to sort of fill in the gaps. Yeah. I keep hearing that from pretty much every guest I've had on the show, that it's sort of like a rough outline and, but okay, this is not for the faint of heart. You have to be pretty confident knitter to tackle something that's vintage. Right. But you oh. know what, what they say, you get what you pay for. So we paid our yes. dues to get to the <laughs> level where we're able to approach these things. Yes. And, but, and they're wonderful. So it's worth it. Yes. I would say more uh, passionate and determined knitting than actually uh, a more advanced knitter. Because back then they were actually leaving things out due to the fact that they assume that you already knew things right. or, yes right. and uh, I have to say I have been very lucky when I have knitted through these patterns because there are very few errors in them I have read plenty of, of errata and errors in other knitting patterns especially when it comes to newspaper and magazine patterns because you know 
there were articles and there were going to be errors due to typesetting. So I've looked at Trove and they transcribe a lot of things. And sometimes these articles go from page 34 and then at the bottom it'll say continued on page 38. Yes. And you have to really find your way to 38 to get the continuation. And if you don't make that extra step, you might only be getting part of the pattern. So I always do the download to PDF. And then you get the whole article. Well, hopefully the whole article. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to read the whole page to get all of the instructions because sometimes they have uh, highlighted the wrong column. Oh. And haven't noticed that it continues in another column or below the highlighted part that's actually in the PDF or right. in right. the right article. Um, some patterns are wrongly um, titled, so you go to another article or another pattern on the same page. So, right, so yeah. just a word to the wise, you know, look out for some of these pitfalls. Yes. It's a really good idea to read through. I know Roxanne Richardson, she puts everything on an Excel spreadsheet line by line and yes. started to do that too. Sometimes when a pattern might be complicated, because when you read it through, then you can really see, do I understand everything before I get started? And then of course, there's some things that you really don't know until yeah. you arrive at that point in your knitting and then you're like, okay, now I'm here. Now I just simply have to figure it out. And that's yes. what's so great about Ravelry and some other forums. And if you get stuck, you can come to people like her or you or <laughs> some more experienced vintage knitters and say, hey, help me out. You know, can you tell yes. me what you think this means? I really like the fact that they have the, the notes in during, uh, under the projects on every project page and thank god literally for those people who have actually knitted this stuff before and have put in the helpful hints that i have knit this way and i found this errata and i changed it like this and mind to remember to do this moment when it's time for it when you come to this step and so on because i have read plenty of project pages for some of these patterns. Not because they perhaps have been knitted before, because I have been first with a lot of patterns, but because how have other people solved it? Right. And that's something that, that's actually very helpful on, on Ravelry, um, because sometimes you find a pattern uh, in the thumbnails and it's like, oh, that's a beautiful pattern. Has someone made it? Yes, someone has made it. And then go to the project page of that person and just look up for what did it find? Was it easy pattern? Was it a difficult pattern? Did it change it something? Did it have to resize? Because I have resized and upscaled the majority of patterns I've knit. I am not a 32 to a 34 right. inch bust. <laughs> Few people from it. are. Yes. Today. And I will, yes. Back then very common <laughs> not not so today no not so today uh this is uh the second jumper on the same year i actually knit it's um also from tro it's called ladies jumper with a jabot and this was sort of a mystery pattern uh, and i would show you why because this is the image that you actually find in Trove. Mm. It, it's a murky picture. Um, but I liked it because I wanted something that was easy to knit, that had an attack of feel and was quite covered up during winter time. And it says Lady Jampus with the Jabot. Um, this is the Jabot part. You actually slide it in through a slit. Oh. And you could knit it white for springtime. So I actually knitted both. So I can change between the green and the white. That's interesting. That was a big surprise when you pulled it out. I thought it was attached. 
No, it, I thought so too at first, but no, you can actually, if you want it white or if you want it green. So you this could put all kinds of things through there. You could put a necktie, you could put a necklace, you could do all sorts of stuff. Interesting. Yes, I've actually had it quite a lot like this, with or without a brooch at my neck. Mm -hmm. uh, just simply because this flops a lot. <laughs> it flops when you wear it if you're bending over or such like that. Uh, I quite like the yebba because it's a nice detail, it's so art deco, but it's not always that practical. And then we have the next mystery pattern I knit, which is one of my favorite, which also was one huge challenge. This is made with thrifted, 100% wool, hand dyed. And it's, um, well, something light as a feather for spring. And it has attached ruffled colors. Which is and attached. It's, it's attached. It's attached, yes. You knit it and then you rush it up and, and, and stitch it down. And all of these stripes are actually made with the yarn, other yarns, a contrast yarn, after it's made. Afterwards, I see. Yeah. Um, and this is a raglan. It's actually one of the few raglans I made. Um, and let's see if I can find that photo. Yes, here it is. Um, I think this, raglan is unusual for vintage. No, it's actually not. I think it's it not came around sometimes as early as during the 19th, mid 19th century. It's actually the Lord Raglan, uh, a British officer who actually started to wear it. I think it was during the Crimea War. And then it turned into a fad in fashion, well, again, during the 20s, 1920s, definitely. And it became more and more popular. Uh, it's quite common in sewing patterns from the 1930s. To so get, the sewing patterns. Sewing. You, yeah, sewing, yeah. Sewing. Um, and this is the pattern photo from this burgundy colored stripey thing with attached color. Yeah, hard to make out. Yeah, it's, it's very dark. But I like the pose of her and I like the, the description in the article of the pattern. So I just thought, why not? If I don't like it, I can always unravel it. Um, let's see, and then I made, well, this cardigan I got on, it's the Rhoda cardigan. I made it back in 2014 for a knit along on Ravelry in the All Things Vintage group, which was a 1940s knit along. Um, and it was finished back in 2015, but I never made it up properly because I didn't like the sleeves because the yarn I was knitted it in, the merled, merled yarn, I hadn't enough for the sleeves so I had bought substitute yarn and it was darker in shade. And this spring I actually thought, well I need a thicker cardigan. Hang on, I, I just do stripes on the sleeves. So it started with the navy yarn and it's striped up to here something. And it's more noticeable when you're out in the sunlight than it is in, in indoor lighting. But it's a that's nice a good, effect. That's a good solution if you're yes. running short of yarn. And this one is the second one I made. Ah. It's exactly the same pattern, uh, but this is in a gifted sort of rent, rent, retro vintage yarn. It's an older production from Novita Yarn. Uh, well, Novita, the Finnish brand. Uh, so it's actually a wool uh, acrylic blend and it's slightly fussy. It's warm, but the fuss, mm, I actually made it to have it at home and wear for a comfy clothes, but it's very nice to have outside too. It's elegant enough that you don't really notice the fluff. It's, I think it's me more personally who doesn't like the fluffy bits. Are you working with vintage yarns or are they mostly contemporary? 
the majority are contemporary. Uh, I have been around in different uh, charity shops, secondhand stores, uh, mission, uh, well, what is it called? Salvation Army uh, stores and stuff. But here in Stockholm, it's, it's less and less easy to find yarns. And often it's you, the odd yarn ball or skein here and there with different kind of unknown yarns. Or it's the 1980s mohair yarn, but it's also mm -hmm one or two skeins and yes nice to have to do scrunchies or stuff like that but you can't actually need a whole garment of it anymore so i returned to modern yarns and this is i made it last year it's actually um, a swiftly knit or quickly knitted cardigan jackets it's from the 1940s also from tro and it's in the article, it's short sleeved and modeled by Betty Davis. Oh. And that's, that's partly why I actually choose to make it, make it. And unfortunately, my printer is so bad, it's, it's very, very faded. So you can't see much of that. No, but you can make out the shape of her face. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually have one more, uh, but I have to fetch it because it fell on the wrong side of the table. Let's see here. I made this uh, in another knit along last year, I think it was, and it's Anyone has seen Home Fire, the British series Home Fires, would recognize it if I hadn't made the error of reading the pattern wrongly. It says repeat 11 times and I just repeated 11 rows. It should be 22 rows. So it's a bit smaller in the color. Uh, no, types. but who knows? I mean... Only you yes. know that, it's great. Exactly. And I wasn't the only one who made that reading error or, or interpretation error. It was actually one more who also thought of, but I like it with thinner stripes. And I have found at least two other 1930s patterns with the same stitch pattern mm -hmm. that are narrower stripes. And I yeah. also made three quarter sleeves because I wanted it, but it's a bit colder. I mean, short sleeves are nice, but if you haven't got a cardigan or something to put on you, over your sleeve, arms when it's cold, I prefer to have long sleeves then on a jumper. What's the warmest that it gets where you live? Oh, during the summertime, we actually have had over um, up to 30, Four degrees Celsius during summertime. I will um, convert that to Fahrenheit and put that on the screen. I have no idea how hot that is. Uh, well, I know that 90, is it 96 degrees Fahrenheit that is the body temperature? 98.6. 98.6, yeah, that is 37 degrees Celsius in, in comparison. Okay. So it, it's, it's, it's hot. Yeah, it's hot. But normally it tends to be around about 10 to 15 degrees lower there, below that. Do you I'll put up times? a little chart here. <laughs> so around 20 to 25 degrees Celsius during summer is quite normal. Okay. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not wool weather during summer. <laughs> it's actually quite warm. Um, but during winter time, Depending on where you live in Sweden, um, we live. I live. I live about halfway up in the country, um, on about the same latitude as a small city or town above Anchorage in Alaska. Oh, so it's quite far up. Oh. I think when I did when I searched and googled, it was. Um, a Russian city or town which was on the same latitude as us or uh, and, and a Canadian uh, city or town but 
we are quite far up. Old. We are further north than, than Oslo, for example. I've heard other Scandinavians say that they learn to knit in school, that it's taught in school, and that all children, I think in Norway, know how to knit, like Arne and Carlos, for example. Yeah. Is that true in Sweden also? Are children taught in school? Yes, we actually have, I think both in Finland, in uh, Norway, here in Sweden, and most definitely both in, in, in the other two countries too, Iceland and Denmark. I'm not sure, but I would say it's a high probability. They have um, some lessons each week from middle grades to mid school to high school. It starts actually in when you're about eight or nine. One lesson a week. And it's so do you know a lot of people who continue to knit, men as well as women? Uh, my boyfriend actually still remembers how to knit. And he's half Finnish. So I think he was taught in school. And his grandmother knit and also wove a lot. She, 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 did, she, she did weave blankets and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. And in Finland, knitting is on high agenda because it's really cold in Finland during winter. It's thanks to all the Russia winds. The Russia winters is called because it's part of the whole continent. And you don't, don't have any higher mountain ranges that actually stop it. So it's the tundra winds that come blowing into Finland. I'll put so a map. Maybe, I'll put a map in here so that people can see what we're talking about, how close it is to the Arctic Circle and yeah, yes. why it's so cold. Uh, the, the Arctic Circle is actually cutting across all of, of uh, the three countries, Finland, Sweden and Norway. And then Iceland is above it mm. or very close to it anyway. So it's only Denmark that's further down, closer to the main continent of Europe. Uh, but yes, we were taught one hour about for 40, 40 minutes um, each week and it was divided by uh, between textile and woodworks and a bit of metal work is too and um, the girls yeah. also yes the whole class so it's mixed excellent uh, because they thought that well you should know how to sew in a button or uh, how to shorten your legs on a pant and stuff like that and for ladies or girls it's like well you should know how to actually use a hammer or a screwdriver or do slight carpeting and stuff like that because it's it's actually quite useful Absolutely. and during i wish they did that in america when i was in junior high school seventh eighth grade mm. the girls were separated out from the boys the boys did shop they learned to work with wood mm. and the girls were learning one um, one session of sewing and another session of cooking. Mm. But the boys did not get to do anything with sewing or cooking. And the girls did not get to go into the wood shop, which is yeah. a pity because, yes, everybody should have rotated and learned everything. But that was our process. Yeah, Same thing with foreign language. You were learning English very, very early on. We didn't start with foreign language until seventh grade for the most yeah. part. And nowadays, I think it's even earlier here in Sweden that, that they get taught English. I started in the fifth grade and I also started reading on English about the same age, well, sixth or seventh grade. Um, That's why you're so proficient. Don't ask me to say anything <laughs> in Swedish. I actually uh, am a former member of the Society of the Creative Anachronism. So I have been uh, meeting quite a lot of Australians, Brits, Americans, Germans, a lot of different kinds of, of other uh, countrymen from Europe. 
and we all had to, you know, talk in one way or another. So it, it turned out English is quite useful. And I also have been playing role playing games, board games, you know, like uh, Vampire the Masquerade and Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. And particularly when we were playing um, World of Darkness games, vampires and werewolves and s those kind of broken end games, everything we did, we, we, we said in Swedish, but everything we said, we actually spoke English when we talked like the characters. Because um, this game master or storyteller, he was actually an English teacher. So it was a great way to just practice English. And we have subtitles here in Sweden. We don't translate and, and, and dub any English at all or other country languages. So we have subtitles. So that's a great way to Here too, speak. here too. Yes, maybe in the 1950s and 60s, some things were dubbed, but it's not, it's not so common anymore. No. If we're watching a foreign film, we're going to see the subtitles in English and hear what they were saying. It's a great way to learn another language. Just listen to the rhythm. How is it pronounced? Exactly, exactly. And for me, I'm somewhat proficient in French. If I'm watching a French film, sometimes I see the translation into English. It's not really what I heard them say in French. No. Sometimes it's toned down a little. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, do you have more sweaters to show us or is that I think that was the lot, actually. Um, really hoping that you were going to have some of your fabulous hats that I've seen on Instagram. Well, you said no accessories, but I oh, could. Oh, well, get them. I mean, to accessorize the sweater. Okay. I could get them, of course, but I have the back of my work in progress. Oh, lovely. And this is, I. If I remember correctly, from 1933 or 1935, trove pattern, um, and the front will be the same but v-necked, and then you have striped sleeves as well. You have a continual serpenting stripe. Oh, that will be fun to see. And it's actually stranded, but I started with stranded and. I wasn't happy about the unevenness when it comes to tension between them because so I made it in in Turkish instead. Oh, okay. And 20 25 bubbles. <laughs> this is this is stranded. Yes, it's beautiful. It's but you know as I didn't carry the blue out in the edge of this end or any of the magenta or fuchsia uh, it got much thinner in the ends than it was your, on the other part of the piece and that unevenness it wasn't really a nice tension it pulled unevenly so that's no why expert. I made it in Tarja. I'm no expert but it seems to me like intarsia would be the way to go since on some of those rows you have a long span of the same color yeah so what I did, I had two bobbins, for example, I think this is 48 stitches on one row. Right. And here is the start of one bobbin with a new intarsa piece, which continues up there. And this is started from there, worked all the way up here. And then I just uh, twisted the yarn on the back here and knitted. In the same color and then I separated when I started with the blue again and work that way and continue with this bobbin. So that's one bobbin working all the way up to here. That was a large piece of yarn rolled up on one bobbin. But other than that it wasn't really that difficult having these many dangly bits because I made it in cardboard and I made them shaped like an eye. Mm -hmm and used um uh, oh, what's the word scissors no no clothespins a oh, clothespin oh yeah miniature clothespins and i just clamped I down the yarn tight 
I thought you like snipped grooves in it and just like hooked it into that because like I, I did that to too, it. but it started to unravel, so I slid it into the groove and I pinned it shut with the clothespin. So at least I just made it so it wouldn't unravel too much and get entangled. So that was quite easy because then I had it close up to the knitting needle. It, right. it, was it doesn't entangled. have a chance to tangle. <laughs> too much anyway. <laughs> but I can get my hats and then you can cut it together. Yes, I'll, I'll pause. Go Great. ahead. Okay, so, we're back. Yes, um, I made a few accessories to match some of the garments and some that actually will hopefully be matched later on. And this is the first piece I made. It's a little cap hat from the 1930s, uh, made after a crochet pattern from 1934, I think it is. And I have way, way wrong hairstyle, but it's supposed to be put on like this, clamped down at a yonty angle. Um, I totally not, love it. Now that's crocheted or you converted it to knitting? No, this is crochet. It's crocheted. Um, and it hadn't any gauge at all. And I had to sort of try out the size. And I got a small head. I, my head is, what is it? I think it's 22 inches. It's okay. 54 right. centimeter. It's, it's on the smaller size. Um, so vintage hats tend to fit really great on me. The modern ones, not so good. Um, but this was actually too big. And I think it's the yarn I used. It was an, I think it was an iron blade. Might be washed something like that. It wasn't double knit anyway. It was heavier than that, but it was what I had on hand uh, in the same color shade as the green jumper with the yebo. And that's why I made it with the white detail too, because it was two colored. The pattern, the original pattern is two colored. And I thought that, hmm, well, why not? Because then I could choose which yebo to wear. And then I actually made a set from 1945, and this is also from Tro, but the original is found in a 1945 Stitchcraft magazine, and let me just put it on. It's very stylish clothes. with the ruching and it's made with uh, changing uh, the needle size. I think it's, you knit them together, then you change the size of the needle and you knit a few rows and then you increase this back to the original number of the ruching. And it got, uh, it got a little um, ribbing, what's the word? Uh, Godo, wedge, wedge, yeah. And it's made together with this very stylish 1940s hat. Love it. And I actually follow the instructions because you have to support it inside. Uh -huh. And the original instructions said that you should only make one loop on each side and then make a sort of a chain and, and attach it. I couldn't work it, so I actually changed it to two and made a knot because it was told to make a knot and attach. But this is as close to the original photo it looks. I mean, it looks pretty similar and I couldn't for my life get it to look the same make a knot and, and just attach it like, mm, no, it doesn't look like it because it looks like there are two legs on the top and bottom of it where you attach it. And this is according to pattern. It's sort of a, a version of a hairnet, I would say. 
it was quite common to use veils on hats back in the 1940s. So this is a knitted veil to look fancy in. Like a Lace. snood, like a snood that you yeah. put like your long bun into. Except it's more of a veil because it's just. It's open. It's, yeah, it's like a curtain. Um, mm -hmm. And this is the latest one I've made. Uh, it's a turban and um, I use double knit and it should be worked in, in fingering. Uh, so it's larger and it got more of a <laughs> Carmen Miranda look, but I quite like it. <laughs> it's huge, but, but it's you can warm. carry You can carry it off. Because you look like you're not very short. I'm imagining you to be above average height. No, I'm five foot four. <laughs> well, but, but it's quite interesting. I'm five one, I, so to me, you're tall. Yeah, I've been I've been told that before when people see photos of me that oh, but you must be much taller. Well, my mom is taller than me. Uh, my dad is on the shorter side. He's about one inch shorter than her and she is let's see five nine five ten something like that oh, so they were tall on my mom's side and shorter on my dad's side so i'm evened out <laughs> in the middle okay i think this is probably a pretty good place to stop unless you have some other surprise up your sleeve that you want to share with us uh, well, I have an Instagram account, actually two, because, oh, yes. and my Instagram account is Jessica Alstrom, and the other Instagram account, which is recently started, it's actually my knitting account, because I take commissions, at the moment mainly on, on turbans, uh, but I'm thinking of actually making it to garments as well during next year and now, if, that's people, if people want to commission you how do they contact you through Instagram or do you yes. have a website no through Instagram okay. and on the account Edith's Knitted Fashion I will put that on the screen don't worry and Edith was my paternal grandmother and she always was very very important that it should be stylish and well put together and I always loved to look at her when she was put together. So that's a little homage to her. Wonderful. Um, so if they want a commission, DM me on Edith's Knitted Fashion and I will get back. Very good. Very good. Okay. So thank you so much. Um, I know there's a big time difference between where I am and where you are, so I don't want to keep you <laughs> too, too long. It's evening there. No, but it's late, late afternoon. Late afternoon. afternoon. Okay, yeah. sorry. All right, so thank you so much for being with us today and sharing all of your wonderful knits. I think that people will go and see many, many more pictures on Instagram when you have the whole thing together. So, yes. Yeah. How do you say goodbye in Swedish? Oh, uh, it depends actually. <laughs> Hej då is the most common one. Um, and then you have på uh, återseende, which is au revoir. My French is very rusty. Um, I'm embarrassed to attempt either of those. <laughs> say, say the first one again. Hej då. Hej. Hej. Door. Hey, door. <laughs> not good. Not, not <laughs> too bad, actually. Not too bad at all, because <laughs> most people have, have difficulties with our uh, more Scandinavian or Old Norse vowels. Uh, o, A, Ö. It's diphthongs. Yeah. And uh, on Gotland, in Gotlandic, because it's a dialect, it would be hey door hey door <laughs> much easier right <laughs> okay <laughs> because, on that note, <laughs> i'm just gonna say in plain english goodbye and thank you so much thank you billy
I guess I pressed the right thing. Okay, so go ahead. This is also from Tro, um, from I think 1937 in, in their articles. But it's actually from a whole other book. And if you go to Ravelry, it's under the other name from that book. Uh, and this intro was Lazy Jumper of Unusual Design. And it's an arrowhead lace, sort of. Um, it's zigzagging. Uh, so you do yarn over decreases and then you have a piece of a triangle which is purl stitch so it's uh, quite an easy pattern and it's a cowl shawl it drapes quite nicely here if you are less busty than I am I have barrel chest too so um, but it's very easy to work it's an easy pattern to to actually work out on. Um, Harriet Basley did exactly the same sweater than as me, but from the original book it was published in first. So <laughs> when I had posted photos on Ravelry with this one, she said, it looks like one I knitted, but it's another name for the pattern. So on Ravelry it has both. She's very nice. I, I had a yeah. little um, exchange back and forth with messages to her a while ago. She had knit something that I thought I might like to knit, but her version looked different from the few mm -hmm. others that I saw on Ravelry. And she said to me, I'm willing to send you this sweater. I don't wear it anymore. It doesn't fit across my bust well. And she would have sent me the sweater, but which I thought was very, very nice offer, mm. but I didn't want it. You know, I want the joy of knitting my own. Yeah. Anyway, okay. I'm glad that we got to see yet one more of your fantastic knits. Thank you again. Thank you. It's actually in my favorite gray too. It's charcoal gray. And that's absolutely the best gray shade on me. It looked blue. It's gray. No, it's, it's gray. It's charcoal gray. It's, it's the lighting that's... It might be picking up from your the sweater that you're wearing. Yeah. Okay. No, it, it's it's dark green. I agree. So.